coaching is not about having power over other people and being directive or advisory. It's really about creating more of a sense of equality, right? And so asking questions and listening and sort of making the space equal among people so that everyone participates. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, I'm happy to welcome Jeffrey Hull to the show. Jeffrey is a highly sought after facilitator, keynote speaker, and executive coach to both nonprofit and for profit global organizations. He is the executive director of the Institute of Coaching, based at McLean Hospital. Jeffrey is also a clinical instructor in psychology at Harvard Medical School and an adjunct professor of leadership at New York University. His latest book is called Flex The Art and Science of Leadership in a Changing World. In this episode, I talk to Jeffrey Hull about the new landscape of leadership. The world is changing, and alpha leadership is not the only way to manage a team. Jeffrey highlights the importance of beta leadership, a style that values emotion and collaboration. According to Jeffrey, the most effective leaders know which style to lead with, depending on the situation. In addition to learning other ways of being, Jeffrey believes we need to leverage perspectives from the indigenous and neurodiverse communities. We also touch on the topics of emotional intelligence, coaching, creativity, and authenticity. This is a really great chat with my friend, who is really leading the way in the coaching world. He is very sensitive, compassionate, and very forward-looking. So without further ado, I am pleased to bring you Jeffrey Hold. Jeffrey Hold, it's so great to finally get you on the Psychology Podcast. <laughs> it's been, <laughs> it's fun to finally be here. Oh man, we've been trying to get you on for a while. You're a legend in the coaching field and uh, I know I have so much to learn from you today, as I'm sure a lot of people have a lot to learn from you today. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. I am uh, happily home in Amsterdam, just got back from India, over the jet lag, and um, settling back at home for a few days, which is kind of nice. How about you? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Oh boy, Jeffrey. Okay. Um, you know, where do we begin with this this kind of conversation? Uh, I'd like to begin with the concept of the beta boss. Now that doesn't sound hot, but you're telling me, no, it is. I need to rethink this. It is good. This is a good thing. I am. That's true. Talk to me. Tell me about your reconceptualization of leadership. <laughs> well, I think that the traditional sort of authoritative leader that uh, fits the patriarchal mold that we all kind of grew up with in the West is still alive and well. You know, I mean, there's still top-down leadership, there's still hierarchies, there's still very directive bosses out there. They have not been replaced um, completely, but there's quite a few things that have changed over the last few years. And I think there's a confluence of a couple of major shifts. One is that the senior ranks of many organizations, especially global organizations, are much more diverse than they had been until you know a decade ago or so. There's more women, there's more people of color, there's more people from all different kinds of cultures all over the world that are part of the global leadership teams of many organizations. So that is a major change that's taking place over time, and it continues to diversify, which is a good thing. And then secondly, in confluence with that is this desire for most organizations to be much more nimble, much more agile, much more creative. We have a highly disrupted world these days with technologies and economic disruptions. And, you know, we could talk about all the different disruptions not even mentioning a pandemic, of course, which shifted things for everyone in the world. So, you know, the world is that much more complex and the need for creativity and innovation is that much greater. So having a one stop or one, you know, one trick pony approach to leadership is no longer going to be as effective as what is needed in today's world. And I think, you know, where I started doing research in this space as a coach, is recognizing that over the last five to 10 years, my clients were changing and they didn't necessarily want to be coached on how to be bossy or how to be authoritative or how to be directive or how to be alpha, as you might call it. So that started me thinking about what are the other ways of being as a leader and the emergent theme I call beta 
is really about building an environment where you hear the you get the best out of everyone. You really try to elevate the performance, the creativity, and the capability of everyone on the team. And that requires a leadership style that's more flexible, that may be directive, may be authoritative at times, but also needs to be consensus-oriented, needs to be collaborative, needs to be inc inquisitive, needs to be a good listener, needs to be empathic, and empathy mm -hmm. is key. And so developing this much more diversified portfolio of capacities and capabilities is really key to success. So I don't think it's either, a, it's not beta or alpha, it's in my world, a development of a flexible portfolio so that leaders can actually choose what's appropriate in the moment or in the situation that will get the best out of everyone. I love that about your approach. Um, so there's definitely a place for assertiveness and for yeah. making decisions when everyone else is un, like undecisive, you know, or indecisive, <laughs> indecisive. indecisive. Yeah. Yeah. I just made up a word, but you know, so there's definitely a place for that, but if that's all you are and you don't listen and you're not flexible, you know, if you're not affiliative, affiliative at all, if you're not a team player that will come to bite you in the butt. Right. Well, not only that, but if you're part of a leadership training program, for example, of high potentials, which a lot of companies at least used to have and many still do, you know, the way that they were training leaders was to be all of that kind of alpha energy, you know, directive, visionary, know where you wanted to go, have your goals in mind, motivate the troops, you know, it was kind of almost militaristic historically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the problem with that is two th twofold. Number one, it's going to attract a particular type of leader. And so that limits the kinds of people that are going to get identified to take leadership roles because mm -hmm. introverts are not going to ch get chosen. People that are naturally more beta are not going to get chosen. So that's one issue. And then secondly, what happens when you want to create an environment where your goal is creative brainstorming, getting new ideas, new ways of operating. You're not going to get that from a top-down directive approach because you can't, you know this because I, you know, we've read your book and self-actualization, this is a key theme. You cannot direct creativity. It mm. doesn't come from being told what to do. It's, it's like, true. you yeah. will go into the shower, and when you come out of the shower, you will have great new ideas. Well, I wish it were that simple, right? <laughs> you know, creativity and innovation comes from a different part of the brain. It comes from a different experience. It comes from being in nature. It comes from a fluid, more relaxed space for the, so your brain is more mindful, more present. And if you're trying to get that level of creativity out of your people in an organization and you're a top-down sort of bossy boss, it's going to backfire. That's the bottom line. And like you said, there are times, like at the beginning of the pandemic, when people were panicking and they were like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And how are we going to get work done in this crazy environment? There was a need for some very strong directive you will be okay. We'll go hybrid. People will work at home. We'll figure it out. You know, those kinds of authoritative leadership styles are useful, especially in an emergency. But it's no longer going to be appropriate and it's no longer going to elevate all the key talent that you have to ask everyone to be that kind of leader. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a real theme of this whole, this whole, your whole research project is diversity in a very, very broad sense of the term. I feel like you're trying to look at it from like every possible perspective. I know that you also care deeply about the indigenous perspective, something that you don't see that often in coaching discussions. Um, and then you're also interested in neurodiversity, which I am very interested in as well. Correct. Um, I applauded yeah. you very loudly at the recent Better Up conference when you were talking about that in the, on the panel. I was like whooping you. I was like, woo, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that was me. That was me. Um, yeah, That's so I great. love that. I love that really, really broad approach. Real diversity to me, to me is, a, is one that is really inclusive of all different ways of being um, but doesn't even, but doesn't mock 
even maybe standard ways of being. You might even call it patriarchal. I don't use that word. It's funny. I th- we think we may differ on that. I think you're more woke than me, <laughs> Jeffrey, <laughs> to be honest, to be honest. But, um, you know, I wouldn't use that word because I guess real, and I just want to get your thoughts on this. It just seems like, um, you know, like real inclusivity is one where we have more of a spirit of like, everyone's welcome at the table, not like everyone but white men, you know, like everyone but. Oh, there's no, yeah. There's no, but. everyone but the alpha. You know, now the alpha is excluded. You know, I just I don't like that spirit. I want the alpha. To I don't either. With everyone else, you know, there's there's room for the alpha. <laughs> you know, oh, not only room, there's a need yeah. for it. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you. Yeah, I don't think we're disagreeing at all here. I think we're saying like real inclusivity is one where we just have this really welcoming spirit of kind of like everyone's welcome at the table, and historically disadvantaged or historically excluded people are very welcome and uh, we need to open up opportunities for them and and so i totally get that i totally I, i do totally get that point I am so excited to announce that registrations are now open for our self actualization coaching intensive while the coaching industry has taken great strides over the years toward integrating more evidence based coaching approaches there's still a lot of work to be done Many coach training programs still lack strong foundations in science and do little to incorporate research-informed tools, methodologies, or approaches for helping clients thrive. For 20 years, I've dedicated my career to rigorously testing ways to unlock creativity, intelligence, and our potential as human beings. Now for the first time ever, I have compiled some of my greatest insights to bring the new science of self-actualization to the field of professional coaching. This immersive three-day learning experience will introduce you to self-actualization coaching, an approach intended to enhance your coaching practice by offering you evidence-based tools and insights from my research that will equip you to more effectively help your clients unlock their unique potential. Self-actualization coaching is a whole-person approach to coaching that aims to help the client find their most alive and creative center of being, connect deeply with themselves, and become who they truly want to become. Grounded in the foundational principles of humanistic psychology, self-actualization coaching also draws from the latest psychological science, including the fields of positive psychology, coaching psychology, developmental psychology, personality psychology, neuroscience, and the science of creativity. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity. Join us and take your coaching practice to the next level. Register today and get 20% off. Don't miss out on this very special event. Go to sacoaching.org. That's sacoaching.org and get 20% off today. I look forward to welcoming you in December. You cover a whole wide range of different skills that are important in this in this new environment, this uh, unpredictable en- environment that we live in today, the mental, the emotional, and the somatic. Do you, would you mind if we went through this? We went through them and we could start with the mental and why those skills sure. are important? Great. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Okay, so flexibility and intentionality are within the mental sphere. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, um, yeah, what are they? Why are they important? Well, I think, you know, when you're thinking about coaching, I, I'm always kind of coming at this from how to coach, um, because that's what I do as a psychologist and as an executive coach. And you know, my work is trying to coach and support leaders to develop their full capacity, their full potential, which is why I love your work, because it's also about that same kind of um, continuing learning journey, right? Expansion. And around the themes of decision-making and intentional communication, there's a whole spectrum. You know, when you're thinking about what we would call like a traditional authoritative or alpha approach, it would be very rational. It would be Mm -hmm. very data-driven. It would be very Mm -hmm. directive. It would be very goal oriented. And all of that, as we just spoke to, is absolutely appropriate under certain circumstances where you want to set a marker for where you want to go in the future, what you want to accomplish, having a clear vision, having a strategy, all of which is absolutely appropriate. But there's a spectrum that includes a whole other, more diverse approach um, or an expansive approach that I call the beta side of things, which is really more inquisitive, curiosity, slowing down and really listening into the space of hearing all the voices in the room. Because sometimes your mavericks, your more creative people tend to be maybe introverts, 
They're not quite so quick to speak up against authority or in the face of authority. So that is where the decision-making process can be more collaborative and more consensus-oriented. And same thing with your communication style. If you're purely rational and data-driven, then at some point you're going to kind of lose your audience because you're not going to be very inspirational. Hmm. You know, people want to know why. What is the purpose? What are we driving towards? And what's the goal? What is the reason why we're doing it? What's the value? And so that requires a storyteller, someone who can share their personal uh, perspective on why it's really valuable for us to do X, Y, and Z, and maybe be able to tell a story, share a metaphor. So those are the kinds of more flexible style of communication, which is really aspirational, you know, sharing why we're doing what we're doing. Mm. And again, it's not an either or proposition. It's really almost like expanding the instrument as a leader. Yeah. Um, the flexibility part, does that, from a neuroscience perspective, kind of relates to certain executive functions of the brain? like? like um the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and you, i mean and training those areas to be attentionally flexible is that do you ever link that to neuroscience yeah well especially when i get when when you get into the emotional intelligence part of it right mm. oh um, yeah. yeah we'll get there so that sure. part of it probably even more than the uh you know rational decision making piece which is an executive function but i think of the intersection between what um, Richard Boyatzis, for example, would call the default network, um, the task-oriented network in our brain versus the beingness network in our brains. And, you know, if you want to create an environment where you have more creativity, people are more relaxed, a little bit more mindful, then the, you know, you have to create a safe space where people feel they're able to be calm, hmm. they can regulate their feelings and not feel like it's an intense decision-making <laughs> rational experience. And that, again, requires a certain flexibility in a leader to know how to basically regulate their own emotions, hmm. but also to create a space for others to be expressed hmm. and to be able to feel safe enough to disagree or come up with a creative way of approaching things. So in the emotional regulation or the emotional intelligence space, it's really crucial for leaders to have this more diverse or more expansive approach that we're talking about. Well, I want, I want you to be my leader, <laughs> Jeffrey. <laughs> I was like, you got the right idea. You got the right idea. Um, and then you're yeah. going to, I know you're going to ask me about the somatic piece, right? No, well, well um, we're not there yet. Well, okay. uh, well I'm, I'm going in order of the mental, the emotional, and the somatic. Okay. You haven't covered, uh, you, you know, we well, started to touch on emotional intelligence a little bit, but that's a whole deep dive, you know? It is. So, um, and, and, uh, so let's, let's do a little bit of a deep dive into emotional intelligence. Cause this is, I mean, you're a world's expert on this and particularly in the coaching realm, um, you know, applying it to the coaching is, um, I think it's quite novel, you know, a lot of coaching programs are so doing, uh, oriented and, and maybe, and, and you would say alpha, you know, and so right. the idea of emotional intelligence, you know, um, that it can be very alpha, you know, an alpha can, uh, can have, it could use a little bit of emotional intelligence. Can, can you tell Absolutely. us a little bit about, about how you define emotional intelligence? Do you, do, do you take the mal, the, the, do you take the salve a Meyer Caruso model? Do you like the Daniel Goleman model? There's so many different models of emotional intelligence. Um, you know, do you adopt one or do you have your own? I'll shut up now and just I want to listen to you. I mean, I think they all have value. Um, you know, Dan Goleman basically popularized a lot of the work that Salavi and others had done in research um, a few years before that. And so I give him a lot of credit for bringing to the masses that framing, you know, self-awareness, social awareness, m emotional regulation, all of those kinds of things were, you know, now they're part of our vernacular in the leadership space and in the coaching space, but they really weren't there 20 years ago. It was all IQ. It wasn't EQ. So, you know, 
Dan and his colleagues, there's a number of them, Richard Biotsis, as I mentioned, and others that have brought that to the public sphere, I think have a real, have added a lot of value. I personally am a big fan of the um, EQI 2.0 Emotional Intelligence Assessment, which I think goes back to Peter Selvey and his colleagues originally. But it, what I love about it, and it's funny because I was just coaching someone today using it, and it was a physician, a very rational uh, surgical uh, surgeon. And, you know, he took this emotional intelligence assessment and he was a little confused as to how it could be so complicated. And, but what I shared with him, which I think he found valuable, was to break down the leadership activities that he's involved in leading a team right of nurses and technologists and anesthesiologists and all these other practitioners all these other clinicians and recognizing that in almost every single thing they do there's an emotional component you're never completely you never completely escape the feelings in the room the feelings of the of the people on the team the feelings that you bring as the leader whatever so emotions are always at play and what this assessment does is it breaks it down into multiple categories like self-awareness self-expression independence versus interdependence a sense of social responsibility one that you would like which is self-actualization whether you feel like what you're doing in emotionally in your day-to-day -day world brings a sense of satisfaction and con contribution there's also stress related emotional intelligence, there's problem solving, like how do you solve problems when there's emotions in the space? And, um, and then things like self-esteem and optimism, all of these are components. And what my client, who tends to be very rational, obviously as a surgeon, loved about it was because he could actually, he could see how the emotional components are so key to all of these different activities mm. as a leader. And so it made a whole lot more sense when we, for example, when we talked about problem solving, his initial reaction was, well, you solve your problems with rational thought, with data, with analysis. And I said, yeah, that's always true. But think about when you're interacting with a patient, another human being, or when you're talking to your spouse or, you know, you're making decisions in your life. Is it really true that there's no emotional component? Mm. And he, of course, re recognized, he was like, you're right. There's, I'm like, I'm always trying to think about the, especially with my patients, like how do they feel about the data that I'm sharing with them? So yeah, problem solving is an emotional activity. So anyway, just to summarize, I mean, I think there are ways that we can break down emotional intelligence into very practical, useful domains that then can be coached and developed um, and I left out probably one of the most important ones, which is empathy, right? Developing your sensitivity to what's going on with other people. So those are just examples. Great examples. What, how does realness come into play here? Uh, I think that's a fascinating uh, angle that you, you bring into the emotional realm of life. What, what does that mean, realness? Well, I used realness just as part of a euphemism for the um, acronym that I created to, in the model that I wrote about in my book called Fierce. So realness mm -hmm. in that sense was just a quick term related to authenticity, which is a much bigger context, a much mm -hmm. bigger concept, construct, right? But what's interesting about this spectrum, we talk about alpha versus beta in the space of authenticity is that again on the more authoritative or alpha side you have authenticity that's very competent and strong and stoic and you want that quality in a lot of leaders at certain times but then think about the other end of the spectrum which mm. is humility mm. vulnerability relatability and trust and those are also key components of authenticity, but they require what we often think of as the softer side, right? Mm. And so the key to success is developing the entire spectrum and then being able to recognize when it's appropriate to be vulnerable, to share your humanity. And what I always find is interesting for clients, you know, when I'm working with executives, 
they sometimes struggle with this because they think that if they share vulnerability or if they open their kimono and share transparency about their own fears or their own insecurities, that they will be viewed as being weak or less powerful. And the irony is the opposite is true. Hmm. They'll be trusted even more. They'll be respected even more. They will be followed more willingly hmm. because their humanity is the, one of the core elements of their leadership capability, right? People love to follow someone who's both strong, but also human. That's mm. why I hit the gym. Get that strong part. No, I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, we got the mental, the emotional. We're, we're basically, folks, what we're doing here is we're going through his fierce model. We've already covered, we've, we've got into fire uh and now we're going to go for the ce part okay so let's talk about the somatic uh, elements of your fire model um first of all before we we, we go into the specifics of collaboration and engagement what is, what does somatic mean what, what does that mean well the simple version is it's anything and everything that's physical right the physical mm -hmm. energy somatics are the physicality of mm. the beingness of our uh how we show up and the reason it's so relevant in the space of collaboration and engagement is because the neuroscience studies and other um, research that's been done around the way human beings interact with each other is that a lot of what happens between people that creates a sense of trust, connection, relationship is based not on the words, not on verbal but on your physical presence, your nonverbals, your eye contact, your smile, which I don't do enough of, I think, but mm -hmm. you know, all of those kinds of things. And even in Zoom calls, you know, I coach my clients, make sure they show their hands so that they don't look like they're just like from the neck up, right? Yeah. So it's all of those kinds of things that are really crucial to creating an environment of safety mm. and connection and trust. And if you're live, like in a room with people, then you want to pay attention to the energy of the space. Um, and I always give a simple example, which is the difference between a, a long rectangular power oriented table versus a circle. Hmm. And when people sit in a circle, there's no automatic boss, there's no automatic leader. Hmm. So people relax a little more. They feel like they're part of a community. Whereas if you're sitting at a boardroom, there's someone at the head of the table that automatically physically creates an energy of power. Hmm. So that's just one example, but those are the kinds of things that leaders need to think about when they start to, to reflect on their somatic presence. Okay. So the two main components of that, thank you for elaborating on that. The two main components are collaboration and engagement. Um, I think a lot of us can wrap our head around collaboration, but what is engagement? How is that relevant? Well, with engagement, I think what you're trying to um, fo focus in on here is the age-old dichotomy of productivity versus creativity. Because when you want to engage with your team as a leader in an organizational context, you often want to get both. And this is a bit of a double-edged sword because productivity is very much management-oriented, time-oriented, structured, disciplined. You know, you have a perk chart you want to follow to get productivity. Whereas creativity as we mentioned earlier, requires a much more fluid space where people are more relaxed. They allow themselves to have daydreaming and kind of see what comes up. And the engagement space that creates one or the other, they're very different. Hmm. They're very different. And I've worked with clients, with leaders that tend to be leaning in one direction or the other. And I think I wrote a couple of case studies in the book of both examples where I had one leader who really wanted to have it. He had a very creative team that was in the media space, but his team never, never got any projects finished. 
They always came up with new ideas. They were constantly brainstorming. And it's because he was so flexible and fluid and created this wonderful creative environment, but then they didn't have enough discipline to get the work done. Hmm. So he had to inject some alpha productivity yeah. approaches to his creative space and vice versa. You know, you have the highly productive, like get the work done kind of leader. And then he demands his team to be more creative. And they all kind of look at him like, we're totally burnt out. You want creativity? We're exhausted. So anyway, you get the idea. Yeah, I do. I do. And, um, and then collaboration, how can, uh, how can leaders foster better collaborative, a better collaborative spirit? Yeah. Well, the first thing, it, it gets back to that um, topic of creating psychological safety. Right. Yeah. And the key, one of the keys there is creating an environment w- where people feel safe to speak up. You mm. know, my friend, my friend and colleague, Amy Edmondson at Harvard Business School, when she started, you know, she's now the world renowned expert in that space, but she started yeah. that project many years ago by studying the operating rooms at Mass General Hospital. And what was the reason that some of them worked well and some of them didn't? And there were a lot of more mistakes in the operating room than was acceptable. And the fundamental key was whether or not people felt safe enough to speak up. And that had to do with the leadership style that was created in the environment. And so if you extrapolate that research that she did into other organizations where you want to create collaborative space, it starts with psychological safety and people having permission to say what they think and not feel like they're going to be chastised or criticized. And then I think the second component, and I, and I spent some time on this in my book, is to have leaders recognize the difference between being an advisor and a delegator and a coach. And they need to do both. There are times when you need to delegate and advise and give direction. But if you want to create collaborative spaces, then you also need to coach. And coaching is not about having power over other people and being directive or advisory. It's really about creating more of a sense of equality, right? And so asking questions and listening and sort of making the space equal among people so that everyone participates. And that's more creates a coaching dynamic. So those are some of the key elements of creating the collaborative energy. Mm, I gotcha. Um, the idea of coach. Well, yeah, let's dive into coaching. Yeah, let's let's dive into that world. It's a good segue okay. because something I really like a concept of your book is this notion of of self coaching. You know, we can we can be our own leaders, our own best leaders as well, right? And I think that's a really cool, really cool way of thinking about life. Um, you know, Karen Horney, the psychoanalyst, called it called it self analysis. You know, like like using psychoanalysis for yourself. But I think the new age, ver- the, the newer version of it is self-coaching. So what is self-coaching? Um, how, can you be, how can you be your own leadership coach? Well, it's funny you would mention Karen Horney because of course my training is originally from Carl Jung. I was a Jungian trained psychologist. Love it. And, you know, his whole fundamental theme was individuation, right? That life yeah. is a lifelong process of first developing an ego Hmm. as a child, as an adolescent, as an early young adult, you develop your ego, which is giving you a sense of competency, capability, being able to operate in the world, right? And you get that mostly from your family, traditional parents, your, your family system, your school system. But at a certain point later in life, that can become problematic because it becomes rigidified. And you get sort of stuck in your personality, your belief that this is the way the world is, this is the way I am. And so Jung would always say, you know, part of your challenge in life is to get over your childhood, (laughs) right? And to constantly be looking for opportunities to break through into what he called like a more permeable, transcendent space. And I think that that it's, it's interesting because that's from like 20, 30, 40 years ago, but I think self-coaching is 
very much along those same lines is recognizing that you're on a learning journey and that you know your personality is not a rigid it's not etched in stone mm. you know studies have been done that brain is a great deal of brain plasticity that we're constantly growing and changing and so if you want to develop yourself you think of yourself almost like a musical instrument and you learn to see it as a lifelong expansion of your capacities and you want to keep an open mind and fundamentally to self-coach you want to create feedback loops you know where do you get feedback from your colleagues from your partner from your friends from your employees you know are you willing and open to taking feedback from wherever it's offered especially if it's done with the best of intentions but you know that is that is a key element of self coaching is mm. and my my colleague marshall goldsmith who's you know mm. the number one coach in the world so so to speak you know and he's he's yeah. a great human being you know he developed this very simple form of self coaching which i mentioned in my book also which is called feed forward where you and i use it all the time where you literally whenever you do something you give a presentation or you put together a new paper or you do something you know where you're producting presenting a product of some sort mm. and you just ask the people you respect people that who colleagues or the audience you know people that, that you know that you respect their opinion to give you one specific thing that you could do even better mm -hmm. that's called feed forward what would i if i do it again and i do it even better what would you think i could do so good right so it's just continuous learning basically and being open to recognizing that you're never finished you're always um on an improvement process <laughs> i'm literally taking notes during this interview <laughs> um, I don't, I don't normally do that in podcast interviews, but I'm like continuous learning and being open. It's so good. You're saying such good stuff. I actually met Marshall Goldsmith for the first time the other day, um, at a better up, uh, coaching, uh, after party when Prince Harry was in the room <laughs> right? With us, and we were all drinking and uh, I, I met him a little bit tipsy and he, I think he was a little bit tipsy and, uh, it was just, he was, he was, he was just really funny. You know, he's just a, I, I, you know. Um, I assume he's like that sober as well, but uh, just we were just really funny. He was just really funny. But anyway, I, r I yeah. really like meeting Marshall Goldsmith. He's very he seems like such being. a great guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you had this great panel at the at the Better Up um, conference, and you were asked, "What do you see as some of the the most important things for the future of coaching?" Now, most of my listeners were not at that panel, so if, right. if you don't if you don't mind um, uh, talking a little bit more about that what you see as the, as the most exciting areas of coaching for for the 21st century um, especially the kind of the world we live in right now yeah no you're right i was a really nice panel and the theme was the future of coaching the future of human development where are we headed what kind of research should we be doing and i think what you're pointing to is that the there were two or three key themes that came up not just from me but from the other experts on the panel one is that we have to become much more aware of the strengths and the potential liabilities of being very Western in our approach. Mm. That we now live in a global village, we're literally a global village, and I mean it literally, it's a small planet, right? Mm. And when I go to do coaching in other countries, in China, in India, which is one of the fastest growing democracies and coaching is huge there. I was just there last week. You know, they don't always appreciate having a Western overlay to everything that's being taught. There's value because we bring a scientific approach. We bring thousands of years of Western civilization and knowledge, but there's also a lot to be gleaned from Eastern approaches, from indigenous approaches from the wisdom traditions of indigenous tribes in South America and the Aborigine, Aboriginal um, tribal approaches. I read a book by Tyson Yunkamporta recently called Sand Talk, which I highly recommend. That sounds great. You know, he, he, he's interweaving the West and the Eastern narratives. 
Mm. And it's just really powerful stuff. So that's one thing, as I think we need to become a little bit more permeable and broad in our perspective on human development and include some of these uh, non-Western approaches. So that's because uh, we would all we will all benefit from that. And for too long, many of them have been marginalized, but there's a lot of wisdom there. So that's one area. And then the second one that I brought up that I think is is also kind of emerging on the scene is how can we leverage um, people that have what we call neurodiversity, you know, that are um, bringing in a, a wide range of intellectual capacities that may not always look sort of mainstream. They may be, uh, and, I, and I'm always worried about labels, you know, people that are on the spectrum or autistic or have um, Asperger's or whatever, you know, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, they need to have some recognition and our psychological psychology communities have a tendency to diagnose and then label, but it, it does bring those things into the um, conversation, which is probably a good thing. But I also want to be careful not to label people and then have them feel denigrated or judged hmm. because there's so much potential, there's so much brilliance, there's so much wisdom, there's so much creativity. Um, and I did, you know, share that on the panel. I think that, t what is it, 10 or 15 years ago, we had an, the American Disabilities Act in the US and mainstreaming of people that had been left out of work, the work world, the education systems, all of which was really great. But now we, we need to go to the next level. And we need to not just allow people that are different into our mainstream systems, we need to leverage their talents and their capabilities. And so this is an opportunity for coaches. Mm. Because I've seen the power of where coaching can really bring to life someone who has perhaps a different way of seeing the world. And it's just powerful. And I, I'd like to see more of it. I'd like to see, you know, rather than giving a lot of um, pharmaceutical approaches to like ADHD and things like that, which may be appropriate under certain circumstances. Yes. But I'd love to see more coaching. Yes. And brought into those spaces of ADD, ADHD, autism, all of those kinds of things. So neurodiversity is an area that I think is um, one that we could do better research and also equip our coaches to be more um, capable and comfortable with. Well, I completely agree. Uh well, obviously, obviously, I completely agree. <laughs> my, my whole career is about supporting yeah. neuro, the neurodiversity movement. But um, I got a, a LinkedIn message the other day from someone, a woman who is a neurodiversity coach. And I, and I thought that was interesting because I'd never heard of that before as like a specific thing. And uh, and, uh, and and she, she, she reached out because she liked my book, Transcend. And I was like, wow, this is amazing what you're doing. I'd love to hear more. And we had a Zoom call and... Um, and she said, you know, she feels a little bit lonely in the, in the coaching space, you know, that uh, there's not many who identify as neurodiversity coaches uh, or, or, who, or who work with that specific population. And so there's just so much potential there uh, in, right. in the coaching community as, as, uh, as, as you've, you've, you've astutely pointed out. So absolutely. Um, okay. What else about the, do you want to keep going? <laughs> we got. Well, I'll say one more. I, yeah. oh, I'll say oh. one more thing about it. Please do. And that is that there's a, there is an intersection between the two themes that I brought up, the bringing in the uh, indigenous wisdom traditions and neurodiversity. Because, and I, and I can give a, a reference, there's a wonderful woman that I had to do a webinar for us at the Institute of Coaching at Harvard um, on neurodiversity and community building. And her name is Lana Yelenev. And she's a Filipino, but she also comes from a indigenous tradition in the Philippines. And what she brought to us was this idea that in many indigenous traditions, if you look at African 
traditions. You look at North American Indian traditions. You look, I, and I learned from her about the Filipino and did, I didn't even know there was such a thing. So even I was taking notes. <laughs> um, in many of those indigenous traditions, people that are considered odd or unusual or what we might call even retarded, which is a really inappropriate term. Horrible word. Or yeah. dis disabled, right? Yeah. Those individuals are actually included in the community because mm. they bring talents, they bring gifts. And so the, those indigenous communities actually ask the question, what is the gift that this individual needs to bring to our community? Mm. Why Ooh, do we have good. someone? Yeah, it's like, why do we have someone who has this so called inability or disability or different ability in our community? What is their, what is their gift? Mm. And that is a wonderful way of reframing what in the West has led to a, almost a monochromatic approach to normalcy, right? Oh, I agree. So anyway, there's, there's this wonderful intersection between the wisdom traditions and some of this indigenous approaches and not just welcoming and respecting, but literally leveraging neurodiverse individuals, getting, getting them to participate and actually be part of the creativity of, that we need in the world. Well, it's beautiful. And I mean, it's, it's also a very powerful coaching question, you know, uh, what is the gift that you bring to the world? You know, it's just, you know, that's from an individual coaching perspective as well, uh, having a very, uh, you know, I'm a very strengths-based oriented guy. What can I say? So, I really right. resonate with that a lot. How far can we take this? Can we take this to, to also viewpoint diversity? Um, that's a little bit more of a controversial topic, but, you know, in politics right now, everyone's ripping their heads off. You know, if it, yeah. oh, you disagree with my political viewpoint, you're dead to me. You know, <laughs> as opposed to like, I don't know, like, would it be cheeky to be like, let's say you're a Democrat and you're talking to a, a Republican, you know, asking the Republican, oh, what are some of your gifts you can bring to the table with your unique perspective on the matters? You know, like, as opposed to just immediately saying, oh, you're a Republican, get out of here. You know, or or vice versa. You know, the Republican looking at a you know a Democrat. I don't know. Can can we can we further extend this powerful coaching question to viewpoint diversity as well, or is that a, a, destined for failure? No, I think it is a. It's destined as it's it's. You're pointing to what is a great opportunity actually in the coaching space because, Whew. um, I think one of the fastest growing skill sets for coaches is group coaching and team coaching mm. and facilitation. And if you really want to learn how to do that well, then you're creating spaces for people to feel safe enough to share what their deepest fear might be or their deepest aspiration might be, their deepest mm. desire might be. And at the end of the day, what we often find when we have enough safety created in the listening space is that as human beings, we all want the same thing. Ugh. right we're not really yeah. as far apart from each other as we think yeah i often go back to my political science classes where when they talked about the far right and the far left and then you realize that the far right they're and the, the far same. left go around <laughs> and they end up being in the yeah. same place they're the same right? they're the same <laughs> yeah 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 there's great opportunity for coaches to become good facilitators in this space to create dialogue because at the end of the day what we're talking about is how can we have more dialogue rather than you know, what's the word for disagreement right dialogue instead of yes yes you know. that was actually next to my list uh to kind of end the interview with you saying we live in an age of convergence and i was going to ask how do you reconcile that with all of our talk about you know diversity and uh and difference uh, but you just answered it i mean you, <laughs> you just did it yeah so we in, in a lot of ways while it seems as though we're living in the age of discord and and strife, you actually think we live in the age of convergence, and that's that's a very unique spin on the situation. Can you elaborate on that and kind of end us end us here today on a positive hope for humanity, my friend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just say two things about that. One is that where I came out on the on what I call the age of convergence is the recognition that all of these dichotomies 
that are embedded in our culture, left brain, right brain, male, female, masculine, feminine. Oh God, you can go on and on. You know, computers are, you yeah. know, bits and bytes, right? On and yeah. off. Uh, system Kahneman, system one thinking mm. and system two mm. thinking, mm. all of which is incredibly valuable on one yeah. level. Yeah. But it's also pointing to sort of a black and white mindset. Mm. And if we want to transcend that, again, I'm so much of a Jungian, it's always about yeah. breaking through the, yeah. you know, the splits, right? If yes. we want to transcend it, we have to recognize that the only thing that keeps us from moving through the fluidity of those dichotomies and bringing them together is fear. Mm. You know, I go back to the Buddhists like Pema Chodron, who mm. basically says there's only two ways of being in the world, fear and love. Mm. You're either in fear or you're in love. Ooh. And if you... And, and that's, in fact, maybe that's the one dichotomy that's worth having, is mm. recognizing the difference between fear and love. Because if you're in a dialogue and you're talking Republicans and Democrats and blue states and red states and all that, at the end of the day, the rancor, the anger is, is really about fear. You know, we're afraid of each other. We're afraid we're going to get hurt. We're afraid that we're going to lose something. We're going to lose the great American dream or whatever it is. If we can shift our mindset, and this is where coaches can help, if we can shift our mindset to recognize that we're all the same, we're all human beings, we all want to feel safe, we all want love. And if we can love each other across the table, then that opens the energy to listen. And when we start listening to each other, we begin to realize that we're not really all that far apart. So. That's my note of optimism, I guess. Um, and maybe <laughs> some people will say I'm doing the rose-colored glasses. <laughs> but I am an optimist. What can I say? Well, I, I'll let me, what I would say is this. There is a really important place for you in this world and your perspective. Um, even if I'm saying even if there are people listening and it's not their perspective and they're like more of like a dominant you know kind of personality you, you can imagine a real a real you know like dominant you know like jacked up on t testosterone listing you and rolling their eyes but right but your perspective is incredibly valuable and that's and and i think that's what i want to highlight today um in this world there's a great place for there's a great place in the coaching world to um you know it's it's almost wide open in the coaching world we we need to you know we need to put this more in there you know emotional intelligence and um and uh, and and all the things you talked about today seriously thank you so much for for i'm so glad we finally recorded this and i'm so glad i can't wait to share this with our listeners so thank you so much for all the great work you're doing jeffrey well thank you for having me it's um ever since i read your book i love all of the work that you did in upgrade and you know in updating abraham maslow's work and and i love your sailboat metaphor and uh -huh. you know a lot of the themes that you write about it in terms of self-actualization um they just resonate so powerfully with me that uh you know maybe there'll be people out there that don't just dis disagree with us but yeah i think what what we're trying to do is positive for the world. And I think your work yeah. also represents that in a really powerful way. Thank you so much. That, thank you so much. I always uh, get confused when someone uh, disagrees with a humanistic perspective, exactly. you know, <laughs> which, is, which is really what we're presenting here, you know. But look, I just thank you so much. That means so much. And uh, glad we recorded this. Yeah. Me too. Look <laughs> forward to seeing you again soon. Likewise. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.